uh, slowing down. Sorry, slowing down uh, carbon emissions, limiting carbon emissions, slowing down uh, uh, global warming by making sure that those people that uh, burn carbons are actually taxed at the source. So Reggie was put into place in 2021. Um, we passed it. Uh, we've entered Reggie. We've entered the uh, the Reggie network uh, where we've cited power plants, where we have power plants. We have uh successfully collected those funds. Uh, I think at this point it's, it's in the hundreds of millions that we have collected. We have used that to promote coastal resiliency. Uh, we have all sorts of flooding issues in Virginia. Uh, we have of course low low line areas in the uh, uh, southeastern part of the state. And then um, we also have the same issue in, in Southwest Virginia. We have a lot of flooding issues. And can you all see me by the way? I'm, I'm getting some something on the, my screen here. Okay. I, I can we can see, see you fine. Okay, there yep. we go. I'll report on my screen. But the bottom line is we've been in Reggie successfully for two and a half years. And this governor has been very, uh, very vociferous, loquacious, whatever you want to say, about withdrawing us from Reggie. And that would be a mistake because it basically would take off all of the carbon tax, all of the basically the ways that we meter carbon emissions and effectively unlevel the playing field. And the way the Reggie bill was written when we passed it in 2021, just it, it effectively gives the governor the ability to enter uh, the Reggie coalition, but by the same token, they can also pull out. So the question becomes, how do we keep this governor in Reggie so that we can continue to put limits on carbon emissions in Virginia and we can continue to build coastal resiliency? And so, I will be filing a budget amendment and it'll pass through the Senate and be part of the Senate budget, which will say that Virginia will stay in the Reggie network, that we will do that as part of our state policy, that we will continue to collect the Reggie funds. We will continue to allocate them. And I think that's just going to have to be one of those positions we're going to have to take as a Senate to hold this governor's feet to the fire. Um, there might be a situation if we had a Democratic attorney general that we could file suit to keep us in Reggie because that was clearly the public policy of the Commonwealth as articulated in the law in 2021, but we don't have a Democratic attorney general, but uh, that is gonna be a battleground. I will simply say the following, that is, look, I've talked with businesses. They, they may not like Reggie, they may not like paying taxes, but the bottom line is we're in the system. It's become a defined cost. As a producer or a manufacturer, you can take that cost uh, you can take it as a tax deduction. You can pass it on to your consumers. It, again, has a direct one-for-one -one contribution for uh, flooding preparedness, which is a huge issue in Virginia. I mean, we've got whole communities that could get washed away in a flood. And rather than generally raise taxes, which nobody wants to do, we have a way of generating these funds in a sustainable way and at the same time promoting sustainable energy. So the Reggie program works. Um, the folks that want to get rid of it were the ones that never wanted it in the first place. I think the public has accepted it. And so I think that will be a major battleground this year. Um, let's talk about clean cars. In 2021, we also passed legislation that mandated basically building out an infrastructure for electric vehicles so you can drive anywhere in Virginia and be able to recharge your vehicle and get back out on the highway. Um, that was very positive. Um, and I think electric cars are becoming more and more of a market share. I mean, it's still below 5%, but it's growing. Um, and then along the way, as part one of the uh, enactment clauses, we also linked ourselves to the state of California and their emission standards, which would seem a little bit unusual that we would link ourselves to another state. But under U.S. congressional policy, um, California has always been carved out and allowed to set its own emission standards, mainly because California itself uh, their economy, I think, is the eighth largest in the world, or maybe even the sixth largest at this point. So they've always been allowed to go their own way on emission standards. So it's a question of if they are moving faster than the rest of the United States, do we want to stay linked to them um, or do we want to stay linked to the rest of the United States? So we made a conscious choice to link ourselves to California. Now, I will say at that time, 2021, we weren't aware that they were going to be mandating that all new cars would have to be electric vehicles um, by 2035. That may have been a little bit more aggressive than probably I was willing to do in 2021. Um, I think we're going to see how this issue plays out. I mean, right now, 
the manufacturers in a lot of ways like electric cars uh, because they get a higher profit margin on them. A lot of that's based on, on you know, federal tax credits. Um, there are some Republican bills to repeal uh, the clean car legislation. They will go to my committee. They will be defeated. So, you know, at this point, we're going to stay the course and we're going to let this issue give it a couple of years to breathe. Um, I will tell you to put a marker down on this issue because kind of like Reggie, I can see this, this will be a battleground in the next couple election cycles. And um, I don't, I'm not usually in the business of following California. Um, I'm very sympathetic to uh, electric cars, the electric car vehicle market. Um, I personally drive a hybrid, so I don't have a fully electric car, but, but uh, I, I do agree that fuel efficient cars are the future. Um, but that's going to be a second issue that we're going to address in the General Assembly. The third issue I really want to address was one I brought up when I met with Sharon and, and the team a couple weeks ago. And this is the issue of data centers. Um, and I don't know who on this call lives in Prince William County or, or Fauquier or, or Loudoun for that matter. But data centers are starting to eat up a ma major portion of the Virginia Piedmont. And uh, that is going to be a huge issue in the next well, it's a huge issue now, but it's going to be a huge issue in the next 10 years. And the Prince William Digital Gateway, which has gotten approved, at least as a comprehensive plan amendment by the county, uh, the county board, that would add 26, 27.6 million uh, new square footage uh, for data centers in western Prince William County. And to sort of analogize that, that would be the equivalent to 144 Walmart super centers. So this is all going to get built out in Western Prince William County. It's going to transform the county. And I don't deny the fact that at least in the short term, it's lucrative. I mean, you have, you know, Amazon, uh, AWS, you've got Google, you've got a lot of other cloud storage uh, companies that, that need areas where they can store what is, you know, a, AKA in the cloud. Um, it doesn't generate a lot of jobs. It doesn't generate a lot of traffic. It does generate revenue, but it also is an enormous uh, uh, user of energy, an enormous user of water. All of these facilities have to be uh, cooled by HVAC. And it also takes up an enormous amount of land, much of which is agricultural land. And uh, I've been very concerned that the placement of the digital gateway literally walks right up to the Manassas battlefield. And as such, it comes right across what had been some battles that, that presaged the second Manassas. And it, to me, you know, at some point you need to make a decision. And, and as I, I like to tell my kids, not everything's about money. Um, and there are sometimes you have to sort of draw the line and I will be drawing the line this session, or at least attempting to draw the line to limit the impact of the gateway. And frankly, I'd like to see an exit strategy for data centers. I do not think it's a long-term solution for Northern Virginia. Right now we have 20% or some, some incredible total of the world's data centers are located in Northern Virginia right now. And it's, it's sort of the issue we had 30 years ago with trash barges coming into Southern Virginia. Um, we sort of rely on data centers the, the same way that the downstate Virginia relies on landfills or maybe casinos, I don't know, but it's become this sort of easy money fix but easy money is never easy money. And in the long term, I don't think these data centers are sustainable. Um, I just think we need to put some pretty serious limits on it uh, because I think you, you've got county board members that they, they see this enormous amount of revenue um, without frankly considering the environmental impact or the impact on, on just who we are as a state. So um, put a marker down on that issue uh, because I think that's important. Um, you know, I, Sharon mentioned I am the chair of the Agricultural Conservation and Natural Resources Committee, and, and I'm proud of all aspects of it. To me, uh, agriculture is still the largest non-governmental industry in Virginia, uh, generates about $80 billion in revenue, everything from timber to uh, every, you know, every fruit or vegetable under the sun, uh, cattle, horses, you name it, all sorts of domestic animals. But, uh, you know, maintaining that a healthy ag sector is important to our environment. Uh, I believe it nurtures our environment and uh, I believe it's the right thing to do. So, so there's a lot of issues out there. You know, it's funny, I've seen kind of the, the energy kind of, you know, when I was in this 20 years ago, it was coal fired power plants that have by and large become completely obsolete. Um, now we're really dealing with, I think there's a consensus that we're moving to sustainable. 
but a lot of that is going to be how do we do how do we balance that move to sustainability while still respecting the environment? Uh, another issue I kind of put a marker down would be solar panels, uh, which are becoming more and more lucrative. Uh, but as a result, we'll start eating up more and more farmland. Um, and I think that look, the technology is going to improve on a lot of these things. Uh, I'm very optimistic. Uh, I think again, the private market has embraced has embraced uh, sustainable energy. I think the private market has em embraced electric cars. I mean, the, the Virginia auto dealers are some of the biggest advocates for electric cars. Um, again, my, the only caution that I would have is preserving open safes, preserving our land, preserving our ag sector, because uh, people are always gonna eat. And that is probably the, the last industry you wanna make uh, you do away with. So that's a, a very, very brief summary. And I think I took uh, 19 minutes um, but Sharon, I'm happy to answer as many questions y'all have. I'm really all yours. And then I got to go spend some time with my daughters that are back in town tonight. So, uh, appreciate it. I'm, I love you guys. So let me know what I can do for you. Sharon, Thank I think so you're much, Senator Peterson. I, we are really grateful for your work and we look forward to seeing more details on your bill when it does drop. Um, I see Cannon's hand is up. Cannon, do you have a question for Senator Peterson? Yes, wonderful to see you, Senator Peterson. From Thank greetings you. from Loudoun. Yep. So, the data center capital of the world. Yep. Um, Seventy percent of the world internet, maybe more now, goes through Loudoun County. I'm so glad. Um, I just loved your presentation. Uh, all the topics you mentioned, particularly data center. Um, you know, I'm running for House of Delegates. Very honored to get your um, you know, uh, support and encouragement. This is one of the biggest issues, Senator, and I'm so glad you have put it on a priority list. Uh, what all you said about data centers is accurate. We used to earn $100 million in Loudoun. Now we are doing close to $350, 400000000 million per year. Um, yep. it's what I call is very addictive. Um, because you get all this revenue with little footprint, um, but the technology is changing. They are not refreshing the computers as fast as they used to in the, in the past. So it's all depreciating assets. So you don't get the same personal property tax uh, as they used to. So when we are committing to services in the county, but when your revenue is declining, then you talk about competition from Prince William, the technology itself changing. So you're going to have a declining revenue base but right. your services are not going to be declining. <laughs> Either right. you have to increase taxes <laughs> or you have to do something. Uh, and so it's, it's going to create a, and, and you know, I, I'm very vocal about that. And I'm so glad, you know, with your leadership, you know, uh, hopefully we can do something, you know, and plus you've talked about the energy consumption of these data centers, it's huge. Many people don't realize um, the amount of energy it sucks. Um, so one of the things I was going to ask you, Senator, is, do you think on, on Reggie or in any of these data center issues, do you think we can get some agreement on telling the industry to say, you need to do certain things? Um, you know, you know, for example, Reggie is different. Reggie is telling the governor to say, hey, this is good. And you know, this is what you know, is going on. And you know, can you come you know, and, and, and meet us? On the data center, Senator, um, can we have the industry to say, hey, you're getting all this benefit uh, from being in Northern Virginia for, for a lot of reasons, they've got the critical mass. Is it reasonable to have you commit to these standards, energy standards, you know, whether it's pollution right. standards, you know, alternative energy standards, you know, you know, uh, there are many, many solutions. The geothermal, there are so many of them, as you know, but I don't think there is any requirement for them to do anything. Right, and I, I think, uh, Kanan, first of all, thank you for your question and, and uh, good luck runner for the House of Delegates. I, I did that in an earlier life. Uh, that's, that's quite an exciting thing to do. Um, yeah, I mean, I, to me, the data center industry is, first of all, some of the world's largest companies, you know, Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook. Um, and I think it's incumbent upon them if they're gonna site these facilities, first of all, don't concentrate them all in one area. You know, that, that's what I find so disturbing is that they're all being front loaded into nor not just Northern Virginia, but basically Loudoun, Prince William and Fauquier. And uh, you're right. It is almost like a, it's it's like a, it's like an opioid. I mean, it's just so much money. But by the same token, as the asset depreciates, then the money's going to drop pretty significantly. And uh, you still have all these enormous infrastructure costs, just the power lines alone that are going to come through all these areas. 
Um, I, I just think at some point we got to say to them, look, where's the technology going? How do we make the technology better? Rather than treating our land as being cheap and saying, well, we can take a, a resource and spread it out over farmland. How do we cite it in ways that it's going to make environmental sense? For example, for solar panels, how do we put them on school roofs? How do we put them in brownfields? How do we put them in places where we're not taking away land from we're not taking away land from farming. We're not taking away view sheds, but we're actually putting them in a way where they can go directly onto the grid and be more efficient. And you know what? It may cost a, a couple dollars more on the front end, but on the back end, you know, we have to save as much open space as we can. And uh, you know, that this economy, this state, it will never stop growing or, you know, it just, it, it's, we're con continually expanding. And we just have to be much, much, much more efficient in how we use resources. And, and this this is really the, you know, like I said, the data centers, the solar farms, that will be the challenge for the next decade, in my opinion. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I think we have time for one more quick question, Francesca. Hi, Senator Peterson. Um, I've, I've been a grassroots activist um, and now I'm working also in policy with different sustainable um, uh, agriculture groups. And I, I don't really have a question for you. I'm just trying to get you while you're here. You're going to miss my presentation, but uh, I, you, you, you definitely did a great preview for me about farmland preservation, saving open space, talking about agrivoltaics. So I'm going yep. to connect you. Your, connect to your office afterwards, like tomorrow. Who is the best person, um, your legislative assistant, to get your attention on this? Okay, um, send it. You know, my my and my my chief of staff, Kathy, had a uh, tragedy in the family, so she's handling that right now. So uh, if I would send it to Tanya T A N I A at FairfaxSenator.com. So just send it to Tanya, and just she'll forward it to me and. Like I said, this this issue of ag preservation is right on my very very front burner. So, I'm so happy. Uh, yeah, anybody and, can send me. I'm all in. I read everything. Okay. Well, Virginia Conserv uh, Virginia Conservation Network. You know them, VCN. They do the Common mm -hmm. Agenda every year. They've got a whole bunch of policy agendas that I think you're going to love. So I'll connect with you. Thank you. Well, listen, that's great. Um, any, any more questions you need, Sharon? Or am I out of time? I think we can let you go and spend time with your family. And we thank you so much for being with us tonight and for your amazing advocacy work. Well, so. let's, let me just put in a plug. Uh, Sharon, first of all, it's great having someone like you who's a, a lawyer and an expert in this field. I feel somewhat underqualified even speaking on these issues, but uh, I've really enjoyed um, learning from you guys. And like I said, I, I, I'm a glass half full guy. So I'm excited. I'm excited to go back into session. I'm excited about, you know, working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to try and solve these issues. And, um, you know, I just, it's a good time to live in this state and I hope we're all going to enjoy it. So thanks again. And I'll, I'll see y'all have a Merry Christmas. Thank you, Senator Peterson. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. Great. And thank you, Sharon, for, for uh, a great introduction. So um, before Francesca gives her follow-up, which I think dovetails so perfectly <clears throat> with what Senator Peterson um, just laid out, I'm just gonna do a little recap of our priorities for this session. Um, so I'll share my screen again. And um, here we go. So just to recap, um, our, our priorities this session are a little bit altered, I'll say, because it's an extremely short uh, legislative session and we are expecting such a tough fight um, for the control of the legislature um, in 2023. We really wanna set it up so that we can provide great messaging for our 2023 candidates. And we also wanna be respectful of everybody's energy. Uh, we know a lot of you are door knockers and uh, letter writers for campaigns. So we wanna make sure that we retain some of our own personal energy, but we do, 
want to uh, defend the existing legislation um, as, as Senator Peterson laid out and as Monique did at the beginning and support a limited number of additional bills and particularly have a little bit of oversight over the what's going on with Virginia implementing federal resources that are available to Virginia in the climate and clean energy area. We also want to expand our working group footprint. So we're really delighted to have some folks from uh, the Lexington area and Richmond and Charlottesville who are getting more active in our group. So we welcome you. And um, as Monique said, we'd love it if, if you all would uh, try to recruit three new members to our group. Uh, our legislative priorities, this is uh, really just uh, what I said, the, in terms of the bills that we would like to support and get your um, ac activity on uh, the fair utility bills and expanding solar. Um, and hopefully after Francesca's uh, presentation, we'll, we'll also figure out a way to support uh, climate smart agriculture and farmland preservation. Um, just a couple of words about what the working group has been doing. Um, primarily Monique and I have been meeting with legislators and their staffs. We've um, met with Senator Peterson, of course, uh, Senator Hashmi and Senator Bell's staff. Um, sorry, I just had a moment there. Um, also, a lot Senator of have been Senator Barker and Senator Marsden as well. Yeah, um, and in all of these meetings, we've been able to successfully get their commitment to stand firm on defending Reggie and the Virginia Clean Economy Act and the clean cars um, standards. All of these legislators are either on the Commerce and um, Labor Committee in the Senate or the Senate Agriculture and Natural Resources and Conservation Committee. So they are the, the committees that are really key to controlling the defense of those, um, those laws. We've also continued to participate in the coalition meetings. Um, Monique, do you wanna just say a quick word about that? Sure, um, we're involved in a quite a number of coalitions and the groups that are working across the state are trying to be very smart about it this year. So there's a group working on defending the Virginia Clean Economy Act that's you know, led primarily by advanced energy economy. Um, there's a group working on uh, defending the all the clean car standards, primarily led by the Conservation Network. And we're working also with the Sierra Club and Virginia, um, uh, Clean Virginia and, um, and among others. So our, our, our strategy is to sort of plug into the work that's happening already, keep you all informed. And when there's key actions to take place at the right time, we can hopefully use your time well as, as well as ours. Um, we've also uh, updated our website page, which is on the Virginia Grassroots site. Um, it's also in the chat, so you can get to this link. Uh, so Meredith has been working really hard with our colleagues to get this up and current. And on that page, when you get to it, we do have our calls to action and we will, we've already started our running list of bills that we'll be tracking and right now, I believe there's about seven of them that have been filed. We have bill numbers and the patrons um, and, they're, and we're opposing all of them that have to do with uh, pulling back on the clean car standards, but you'll see more of those pop up on that page. Okay. And I will um, be introducing Francesca and Amy, Francesca would like to share the slides from her um, desktop. So while I just oh. speak for a minute, if you could release your screen and Francesca can share hers. Um, and again, I think it is wonderful that we have this, uh, this topic right up, right after uh, Senator Peterson's talk. Francesca Costantino is a policy advocate for sustainable agriculture and local food systems. And she had a career in food security 
agricultural development and climate change with the US Department of Agriculture and Energy. And since 2019, Francesca has worked in local food system investment for community development finance institutions in Virginia. So I'm sure that's a whole nother topic to uh, learn about. Um, and uh, currently Francesca is a policy liaison for the Virginia Association for Biological Farming and National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. And she's also uh, proudly had a brief stint as a suburban chicken mama. So she has degrees in economics, agricultural development and business. So I look forward to hearing uh, about the policies that are happening uh, that, that we'll hear about this General Assembly. Great. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay, um, great. I'm really happy to be here. I could not have asked for a better preview from Senator Peterson himself about the importance of this topic. So I'm going to be talking about different General Assembly policy agendas um, in these four topics, preserving farmland, climate smart agriculture, utility scale solar, and agricultural best management practices. Um, and I know your our coalition, because I'm part of it too, um, is really concerned about policy that can help Democrats get elected, really. Um, and so why are rural areas important for progressives? Well, if 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 we're going to get rural people to vote for Democrats, you have to have policy and programs that benefit rural communities. You have to, you know, care for show that you care for them and care about their issues uh, and not just a photo op. So, um, uh, one thing that I, I wanted to convey to the committee, people don't normally think about agriculture when they think about climate. They think about transport and energy. But agriculture has a huge climate impact. It's 10% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, more like 30%. If you look at downstream, like transportation and processing. And agriculture is getting more carbon intensive because it's getting industrial. We've got confined animal feeding um, operations. We are um, uh, changing grasslands and forests to crops, and we're producing uh, grain for animal field with chemical inputs. So agriculture really is a climate solution. Any climate change policy agenda should include it. We want to shift from our industrial monocropped commodity agriculture and go more diversified, local, regenerative, and value added. And farmland, if it's managed regeneratively, um, it has the same benefits as wetlands, improving soil health, water quality, biodiversity, all of that. Um, beef gets a really bad rap and it's really the how not the cow because if you're grazing, those pasture grasses actually contain 20% of the world's soil carbon stock. They, they actually sequester carbon. Um, and there's a great carbon sequestration potential if it's 100% grass fed beef with um, holistic management practices. Um, just some definitions, regenerative agriculture is even more than sustainable because it regenerates our natural resource base. It's a na nature-based holistic land management practices um, that is actually mimicking ecosystem processes and using them in photosynthesis to sequester carbon. And in, um, in the agricultural area, that's no low-till, cover cropping, rotational grazing, composting, things like that, silvopasture, which is trees and pasture. Um, these slides will be available. So there's a lot of detail. There's a YouTube link and some links to um, other reports that you can read more. Um, uh, some of you may be familiar with Project Drawdown. It's a fabulous resource which has studied the various uh, strategies for uh, reaching, um, you know, stabilizing the climate. Agriculture actually ranks higher than electric cars and offshore wind turbines um, as far as some of the solutions. So you've got things like it's uh, out of 76 climate change solutions, agriculture is higher than is in the top 24. It includes things like silvopasture and managed grazing. Um, and our agricultural land is under threat in Virginia. As um, the Senator mentioned, Virgi uh, agriculture is Virginia's largest private industry. And we have fabulous agricultural land. A lot of it is nationally significant, but we are in the top uh, top states, the 13th for risk of ag conversion. Um, and especially you guys are seeing it and data centers is, is one of the issues, right? In in, in our um, urban areas, in our major urban areas, we're seeing the, the loss of the farmland. So the, the, the graphic on this slide, it comes from a report that American Farmland Trust 
and orange box means that in Virginia, our conversion threat is, is greater than our policy response. Um, this is a graph just showing all the different things you can do for farmland preservation. And again, um, Virginia's response is less, is less than the conversion threat. And that's the link to the report. Just a, a, a graphic to show there's a lot of red in Virginia um, and it's around our, our um, urban areas. So uh, anything we're trying to do in, in any topic, really, we've got a difficult budget situation um, as far as um, and a difficult, difficult political situation um, for farmland preservation. All the major funding areas were cut um, the, the, for conservation, farmland and, and the AFID ag in, infrastructure development. But we can build on success. So in the last two years, we did succeed in getting some legislation passed for sustainable agriculture. Our um, great ally, Sam Rasool, created and then uh, it created a local food and farming infrastructure grant program. Um, some of the uh, there's two Republicans um, that have sponsored some things. Uh, uh, small scale meat processing is important to get that grass fed meat. Um, happening more locally, and there was a there was an equity win, uh, very kind of um, in the weeds issue, but uh, a Republican um, did um, sponsor that. So um, I also work with a wonderful coalition, the uh, Virginia Conservation Network. Every year, there are 150 plus conservation sustainability groups. Every year, they produce a common policy agenda for the General Assembly, and these are the links to the three that are relevant for uh, climate smart agriculture, uh, preserving farmland, utility scale solar, and the ag best management practices. So um, I'm, uh, I'm not gonna go into detail. Um, these slides have the detail of all of the um, policy proposals. They are in those papers, but in general, um, I'm just going to read this paragraph because it's the strategy. So uh, farmland preservation and promoting the high value um, organic um, and climate smart commodities keep the farmland in production. That's what we need to do. It's what the senator said. We want to keep the farmland and farmers producing uh, and farmers have to be able to make a living. And that's another thing that we need to do to make sure those, that, that the land stays as farms. And then um, we need to facilitate agriculture's contribution as a climate change solution to sequester the carbon in the soil and plant material. Um, and one of the aspects is thoughtful impl implementation of, a, of um, utility scale agrovoltaics, so we're not putting it on farmland. So there's a variety of things. The funding is important, helping localities um, participate in purchase of development rights, and then some kind of technical assistance and policy issues, studying how to preserve the farmland in um, the uh, through the local zoning. And that low residential, low um, uh, density residential, that just means sprawl. That means, you know, the urban, peri-urban areas, that's where the farmland loss is occurring. And technical assistance for uh, localities and solar and water districts to set up farm um, farmland easement programs. Um, supporting value added production for farmers so that they can make a living a meat processing fund to invest in small scale meat processing so that grass fed um, livestock can get to market and in increasing funding for this program for um, industry uh, infrastructure development um, that VDAX has. Um, you Utility scale solar, there are some um, proposals as well. Uh, this 35 million is to make sure that those, um, that utility scale solar is in, is in brownfield, exactly like the Senator said, on, in, in land that is already, you know, developed um, and not on the farmland. Uh, demonstration projects and really just some, some standards for um, these solar projects and, and where they do displace making sure there's mitigation for the displacement of the ag agricultural land and the forests. And then an important area for farmers to actually um, keep their land in production and do these wonderful climate smart ag practices. There's uh, some people may know in the conservation area, it's called agricultural best management practices, tends to be in the conservation agencies where you pay farmers to do things that are too costly for them to do on their own dime, um, can include stream exclusion, but the composting, the cover crops, all of that. So funding for that full funding for that, technical assistance, and um, other financial incentives. 
So um, that's it. That's who I am. Um, anybody who really feels drawn to work on this, I, you know, please contact me. I welcome your help working with me on this. Um, and I look forward to hearing more and taking your questions. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Francesca. That was a lot of information very quickly. Um, but if anybody does have a question they would like to ask, I think we can have some time and um, Amy will now um, bring uh, her slides back up. But I see Canon, if you'd like to unmute. And yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca, for the wonderful information presentation. I was going to ask you some priority perspective for this session. What, what do you think um, would be more impactful if you want to, you know, you obviously you have such wonderful information. What would you say are the top two things we should, we should really focus on? Well, as a I... I don't know if I would. I, I'm going to. I don't know if I would approach it that way. I, okay. what I, because I think we need to hear what the legislators will carry. So um, we did hear from Senator. Yeah, we we heard from Senator Peterson that he's interested. He's really concerned about the data centers. And yes. I, I I had. I mean, I am too. But I I hadn't really thought of that. So that's brought it to my mind that maybe there's something there that we can follow up with him on. Um, I mean, I think that's kind of the trick. I mean, I, I, I like the way you're thinking, but I think really legislation comes to pass because somebody wants to carry it. I, I, so, I fully so, agree with you. I actually yeah. like your thinking and I can give you a ton of data on data centers living in Loudoun for 25 years. And uh, this, is, this is a huge, I'm so, so glad Senator Peterson brought it up. Uh, it's one of those, you know, uh, out of sight, out of mind thing that nobody thinks the amount of energy they guzzle. Um, so it's massive. Well, uh, all I would say is that all of those ideas are in sure. the common agenda. And um, I'm going to be reaching out to, um, I'm a little late this year, but uh, um, I'm going to be re reaching out to legislators and seeing like what sticks, you know, what they're interested in carrying. I, I, it sounds like Senator Peterson is a really great place to start and we have our usual suspects or whatever. But and if there's anything we can collaborate on data centers coming from Loudoun, and this is one of my platforms in my House of Delegate Race, I would love to connect with you and see if we can work with Senator Peterson's office. Um, and, and, and pull some data. And yeah, I, can I, I, some data. I, I will again. I can put my uh, contact information in the yep. in the chat, but also Please. Keith Oberg and you know I had mentioned definitely we. Uh, I will make sure that you guys get the presentation. Thank you. Uh, send it to Amy and Meredith, and they can send it around. Um, but Thank it you. has it. It also has my contact information. But I I will put that in there right now. And anybody who wants to work with me on this, it's great. I mean, it's Thank the normal. You. You know, I, I've already done a lot of the heavy lifting. We've got the presentation. I've got talking points. Yep. Uh, really, it's just people approaching their, you know, delegates and senators and saying, hey, we want you to carry some legislation and seeing what happens. And Francisca, you. You see Thank you. Sharon um, has a question. Um, you know what? I, I, I just want to um, say one more thing that Delegate Rome, we've had a conversation with, and she's also interested in this topic. Um, is it possible for us to hold that question, Sharon? I, I, I want to make sure that we get through our um, our agenda, and then Francesca, if you can stay on, um, you know, maybe maybe there will be time at the end for some additional questions. Is that okay? So um, I know this is, you know, we're kind of jumping around a little bit here, but we want to just focus again on, on um, impactful actions that we can do. And Francesca has told us that, you know, she will, she is willing to share calls to action with us um, in, in the space that she's most active in. Um, I think Meredith or Monique, were you going to talk a little bit about uh, this slide. Sure, yes. Yeah. We look at the uh, session uh, coming up very quickly after the holidays. Um, we'll be calling on you to help us. Uh, sometimes it's really great to pull in constituents for key meetings um, at key points during the process, but certainly as things pop up, 
and we want to weigh in um, with the legislators, uh, we'll let you know. Um, we'll have actual calls to action emails. Some of them will be our own, uh, like the one on our site today uh, that you can access, uh, but also through the partners that I mentioned um, that are running um, the bills, you know, working with the, uh, the patrons of the bills. Um, again, we're asking if you can help us recruit um, more folks to be part of this working group area so that we can uh, expand our membership, but also for the grass, the Virginia Grassroots Coalition overall as we move into this busy election year. Uh, we do have social media channels um, and we'll remind you of those in our follow-up email. And then the other actions, the specific things that will come up, uh, there will be opportunities to testify before committees and subcommittees um, as these bills come up. Um, letters to the editor, we've talked about uh, possibly doing a sort of a letters to the editor workshop uh, so people can be really comfortable with this easy way to communicate. And then lobby days. And uh, we are going to, we won't be doing our own lobby days. It's a heavy lift, but we will be supporting and helping to bolster lobby days of our key partners. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Meredith to highlight a few that are coming up. And then if if you want to mention a word about opposition bingo, because I haven't played that before, so <laughs> uh, we'll we'll probably be setting that up as a fun way to track this this crazy session. Yes, uh, that that version we have up it was the Senate campaign, kind of in February, and uh, I think we'll we'll have one earlier. Um, the lobby days we should have an additional slide on but oh interesting um okay the <laughs> the text uh, is missing but um the january 24th uh defend standing up for democracy day is partners on the um uh, grassroots coalition and there is a date if you want to get a hotel room with the group send an email to um, big money out Virginia that's Nancy Morgan's organized a block of rooms um, and there's a December 23rd date to get um, get in for that uh, our main Energy Burden Coalition, uh, along with Clean Virginia, Sierra Club, many partners is having the January 26th um, day for affordable energy. And there will be a training virtually the night before uh, and registration is open for that and look for links for it in our follow-up. And uh, the Conservation Lobby Day, and I will- That's on January 31st. Since yes, um, it's 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. There's an early bird rate if you register by the 14th of January of $25. So just a, a date to uh, uh, note for that one. So I also just want to mention that our next uh, Zoom meeting will be Monday, January 9th. Um, we're waiting for confirmation from um, another speaker, but we um, are really delighted Blair St. Ledger Olson, who is uh, with the Climate Cabinet, uh, which is a group that provides um, almost like a bespoke legislative support to state and local legislators and does uh, work endorsing candidates for state and local office who are climate um, champions. We'll get, and she's just a dynamite uh, lobbyist and extremely knowledgeable about what's going on with Virginia um, legislation and policy. Will um, give us sort of her insider's look at the General Assembly, which um, the the session begins on Wednesday, the 11th of January. So it will be just kind of right before the session begins, and it should be a really exciting, interesting presentation. And with that, I think, um, we can um, 
if if people now have questions, um, we're a little over the eight o'clock, but not by much. So Sharon, did, did you still want to ask a question? Just providing some information from Francesca, there is going to be another bill out there on data centers. It may be, and if, I don't know if Susan's still on the line, but I know there's some discussion with Jill Vogel, maybe some others about doing a study about data centers. I don't know the details of CHAP's bill, but uh, the data center study is one that's percolating through. Susan, are you there? Can you comment? Yeah, all I know is that Connor, our paid lobbyist, is talking to Jill Vogel, and she was interested, but I don't know the details. Okay. Great. Any other questions or things folks want to share? We are waiting for the um, the Air Board, Air Con Pollution Control Board, to open up its uh, comments comment period on uh, getting out of Reggie. So we do plan to share a call to action around that once that opens. <clears throat> and and there, there was a meeting today, uh, we should mention with the uh, oh. Joint Commission on Administrative Rule in the legislature about the Reggie pullout. And they had sort of a presentation for both sides of the, the issue with the concerns and the legal concerns raised um, uh, by uh, lawyers from the uh, Southern Environmental Law Center. Um, what I heard from a reporter I spoke to earlier today is that they did vote to send a message that we should, they, you know, should be pulling to the governor's office that we shouldn't be pulling out of Reggie. So um, I think the, the legal battles will, will continue and become more formal um, should they continue this process with the comment periods and the filing of uh, the regulation. Right, just you know, to follow up on that, um, Senator Peterson did mention if we had a Democratic Attorney General, mm -hmm. they would file a lawsuit to you know force uh, the governor to stay in Reggie, but um, a lot of the groups like the Southern Environmental Law Center and Sierra Club and others are, will likely file a lawsuit to, um, to basically declare this regulatory attempt to, to withdraw from Reggie um, to declare that uh, invalid. So I saw Susan had her hand up. Yes, I was, so I was curious, um, did they record that meeting today, do you know? Money. They, yeah, they did, Susan, and the link wasn't up yet. Um, and unfortunately, I couldn't uh, attend it today. Uh, so I'm yeah, watching for either. the. Yeah, I'm watching for the link, and it'll post. I noticed they had some. It looks like there's maybe a a couple of days lag till they post it, but we could send that out to the group as well. Yeah, I think it might be really interesting because because Senator Deeds was really going to manipulate the the circumstances. I think to make the point that we need to stay in, that we uh, legislature passed the law and we need to stay in Reggie. Um, yeah. And then for Francesca, I, I know you said that, you know, it's not the cow, it's the how. Um, and I have a huge problem with um, CAFOs. How do you get the farmers to change the how? Well, I think a lot of them want to change. It's just the whole system is set up for industrial agriculture. And, you know, we have a tremendous uh, um, safety net and uh, subsidi subsidization for cheap corn and soy, which feeds um, processed food companies like Kraft and General Mills and, and um, you know, Tyson's and Cargill and all of that. So, you know, the farmers want to do it. They just, you know, uh, they, um, they're stewards of their land. And um, they like their, an most of them want their animals to be treated well. I mean, I think there's a lot that want to do it. It's just the incentives, the, the whole system is, is stacked against them. And so that's kind of what, you know, what, what we try to do is um, make sure that they can make money with more niche um, value added products like grass fed and organic and regenerative um, and, uh, 
addressing some of the infrastructure issues, making sure that they've got processing so they can get to market um, and educating them. I mean, I think uh, there's many, many stories. I can put some things in the chat or uh, happy to talk offline later if other people want more information. But there's a gentleman named White Oaks. Uh, I'm sorry, a gentleman named Will Harris of White Oaks Pasture. And his whole story is that his family was doing commodity agriculture and he just didn't like what it was doing to the land and the animals and um, commodity agriculture is very small margins anyway for the farmers and just made the transition. There's a lot, lots of stories like that. I still don't understand what legislation can happen in Virginia that would impact that. Well, we, uh, the, uh, the, the three uh, papers that I sent, you know, that are part of the common agenda. I think that's okay. a place to start. And do you already have bills going in for that? Because if bills aren't already in, filed, they're not going to happen this year. Yeah, well, I mean, at least then it's uh, awareness for next year. I mean, you know, we do what we can as volunteers, right? No, I understand. I'm just curious if you had um, sponsors. Thank you. Uh, no, yeah. Okay, great. Um, Canon. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my question on Reggie was, do you know, because any of you know, is this the governor just thinking, okay, well, I just want to get out. There's no, there's no other part or, okay, what works, what doesn't work, what can be improved, you know, what, you know, it's been there and what, what's the feedback? Uh, how do you make it better? This can be a zero. Yeah, approach. if you if you and I put in the link, I put the link to the JCAR, um, the 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 session that happened today, and you can keep watching it. I think Susan is right. It would be very interesting to watch it. And if you listen to the arguments uh, that Secretary Voyles is making, it's just a full out. We're pulling out. It's not that they want to improve it. They're just saying it's bad. And they're using all the talking points, frankly, I suspect from Andrew Wheeler, who's in, in the scene behind, sort of behind the scenes, you know, this is just one of his projects. Oh, it's so, so disheartening. It, it's, it's not up for negotiation. It's going to end up being a lawsuit. Yeah, I think it's all, so, about, it's all about the Yunkin's play for, I'm going to reduce your taxes. He calls it yes. a tax. And so it's it's one more tax that he can tick off. And it was what, $2 and something a month for every um, yep. Dominion customer. It's nothing, right? It's half of a cup of coffee somewhere. <laughs> I don't go to Starbucks, so I don't know what it costs. Yeah, but, it's, it's, um, it's pretty disheartening and very disappointing. Oh, well, but that's the, that was his angle, right? I'm gonna cut yep. your taxes. And that's mm -hmm. the budget. That's what he's saying. I know, well. I agree. Thank you. Natalie? Yeah, I was able to uh, watch the um, JCAR meeting this morning. And it was the first time I really ever heard Secretary Boyle speak. And the few times I've attended Republican uh, Party meetings, and it were just Donald Trump, listen to Donald Trump, it's the same old game plan. You spout off misinformation and falsehoods and you say it enough times and then it's truth. You know, the claims that Secretary Boyles made was not backed up with any kind of documentation or evidence, completely baseless. But then um, SELC did a great job of refuting the arguments they made, but it's, and it, it, it was just really appalling. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it was just the same old Republican playbook this time for Reggie and claiming that they're going to reduce taxes. Um, so some of the um, really bad claims they made was that uh, Virginia was uh, reducing its greenhouse gas emissions before entering into Reggie and that Reggie um, is not um, going to be able to reduce greenhouse gases. It's not going to be able to create funding. And, you know, we, we, everybody here knows that's, you know, BS. And um, SCLC was, you know, I guess they had seen the claims before. And so they were able to refute mm -hmm. them right away. So anyway, it, it was really disheartening. And I don't, I, don't, I, suppose, I, suppose, I don't know if he's still acting secretary, but he was representing the department. So 
Yeah. And just so you know that we had already seen a preview of this with his presentation to the air pollution board, and I assumed it was going to be pretty much the same presentation. Um, so we did file a comment letter on behalf of Virginia Grassroots Coalition. So under my, Amy, and Meredith's names, so this working group could sort of register our concern. Um, and we'll, once that's posted, that becomes part of the public record with this JCAR proceeding, because we felt the same way, Natalie, even before we heard what he was going to say, because we figured it would be a repeat. Um, and there were about 800 or so comments filed in the preliminary proceeding. Um, like 750 of them were against pulling out of Reggie and from a lot of reputable organizations and experts. So uh, they disregarded that in the uh, in the air board meeting, completely disregarded that. So. Anyway, we will be watching because there could be legislative, uh, there's very likely gonna be a straight out bill just to pull out uh, that's been raised in the past that we will oppose. Uh, so we'll be keeping an eye on the legislative side, but we'll also be keeping an eye on the regulatory process and let you know when you can weigh in again. Susan, do you have something else? Susan, your hand, oh, your hand's down. Well, um, what an interesting uh, conversation we've had tonight. It's, uh, <laughs> I just, um, I've learned a lot and, um, you know, a lot of food for thought. So I thank everybody for joining. Any, any further questions or concerns? I just want to say, I'm so glad I joined. It was an excellent session. And I'm so, so glad data centers is bubbling up because it's it's one of those things that yeah. <laughs> it's out of, I mean, it's there everywhere in Loudoun, but people, anyway. And so then my, you, you talk to everybody, oh, it's great, you know, less number of foot traffic and 100 employees per building. Excellent. But the, <laughs> behind the scene, it's this. Anyway. So my understanding with data centers is that, that CHAP has submitted a bill so that there's something in... Um, for drafting. Yes, and I follow up with him. One of my no, but my understanding think, is that he did not plan to carry the bill. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't know. So there need so if people have sponsors, they think they yes. you know, yeah. if somebody puts I, it in for drafting, somebody else can pick it up and yeah, run with it. Right? That's a great point. Yeah, my point over the years here has been that we can't just say 70% of world's internet traffic goes through Loudoun and just stop there. You know, we have to be innovative and we have to be leading edge and cutting edge on energy consumption because that's never talked about. Nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to think about it. Uh, it is not magic. It's, it's, it's just a ton of usage. Well, Susan, if you, or Sharon, if you hear of um, other possible patrons for this, I, you know, I think uh, Chap told us that there, he might have two bills. One would be aimed specifically at the Prince William gateway, which, to my thinking, it would be more appropriate to have a Prince William senator um, patron that one. And the other one would be a more general um, bill aimed at data centers. I, I just reached out to Chap again to get more details because I was pretty sure he said he was going to carry a bill. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe, I, but, okay, maybe but I have not uh, lost a minor. But because I've taken a step back and I've not been tracking tracking LIS, I certainly haven't looked to see if something's it's, dropped. It's not in LIS. Mm -hmm. But I will I will continue to interface on that issue um, and let folks know what I hear. Also, um, I had heard that Senator McPike might be interested. Um, that would be handy because he's Prince William County. Exactly. Oh, that would be great. Yeah. That would be, this is a big deal. 